That's been quite the day. <laughs> it's a good one. Of course, I didn't bring any food. But sometimes, there's a lot of you up there can relate. Get tunnel vision on being there first, first light, and getting that hook in the water. And nothing else matters. <laughs> I've had that weird disease for a while. But anyway. Let's see what we got from the people and what they want to share with the people. It's never a shortage. All right, this is titled, this is titled, They Stole My Joy, My Nephew Shot One. All right, here we go. Hi, Steve, I appreciate anonymity. Anonymity. <laughs> You know what I'm trying to say. Anonymity. Anonymity. <laughs> Anonymity. My family doesn't need any three or four letter groups snooping around. You can use my first names if you want. My name is Mike. I'm 55 years old. I'm originally from southern Ohio. My family has property along the Ohio River, but I now live in central Ohio. My cousin has a few hundred acres of land that runs along the river that we built a hunting cabin on. The cabin is approximately a quarter mile away from my cousin's farm. In 2002, I took a couple of guys to work with spring turkey hunting at my cabin. These guys had never been turkey hunting before, so I asked my 12-year-old nephew to guide one while I the other. Now, before people get pissed about a 12-year-old who guides, I will say that he was and is a better hunter and fisherman than anyone I know, a natural. We had to leave two hours before daylight to get to our spots. After the first 20 minutes, we split into two groups. I like to hunt the old reclaimed strip mines, and Luke, my nephew, likes to hunt power lines. After me and my partner got set up on a ridge on the reclaim, we settled in for daybreak. Right at daylight, I noticed the woods hadn't come alive. My buddy adjusted his position on his box call and his vest made a noise. Then came the loudest roar I ever heard. It vibrated in my bones. It lasted about 10 to 15 seconds. And after about 10 seconds of silence, then came another roar coming from the ridge my nephew was on. We all wear camel head coverings, and when I turned to my friend, all I could see was eyeballs wide open. When he found his voice, he said, what the hell was that? I told him I hadn't a clue, but these 12 gauges aren't enough. We picked up decoys, hiked back to cabin. After a while, my nephew and his buddy returned. And here comes my token helicopter. All I gotta do is hit record and a frickin' helicopter goes by. Right dead over top. <laughs> so one thing when I move away from here I'm not gonna miss is all the freaking helicopters. Man, they're a pain in the ass when you're out in the middle of paradise. I asked Luke, away from the other guys, if he heard that roar. He asked if it was messing with them this morning. I said, no sir, it wasn't me. He asked what I thought it was again, no friggin' clue. Like thousands of people, I researched what that roar could be. After reading for a while, I lost my breath for a minute. All kinds of shit flooded my memory. There's one spot back in those hills where at least a handful of times that I felt what I read was dread. I would run for about 400 yards until I would reach the pasture. At age 17, I see structures and twist, but shrugged it off. I smelled death at that spot. After my hunt, I asked my uncle if he had a dead cow back there. His eyes shot in that direction, and he seemed nervous, and said, Whenever I see all the cattle up against the barn, that I should hunt the front 40-acre pasture. I asked him why, and fumbling words, he said, Because the birds will follow cows scratching me. You're scratching me. You're for, for grain. You know, he was right. I killed several big toms that way. Fast forward to 2015. My nephew, 
now driving age, took one of his friends to the cabin for spring turkey. They got there late, so they hit the bunks. After some time after midnight, my nephew woke up to piss. He walked by his friend's bunk and he wasn't there. He walked out on the porch and there was his friend kneeled down with a gun pointed out the door. He asked Luke, what the hell is that? Luke said, the fire was barely a glow, but moon was bright. He said as his eyes adjusted, he saw a figure on two legs standing beside our portage on 30 yards away. My nephew said it was a head talker. Then the outhouse. My nephew said it was a head talker. Then the outhouse and damn near twice as wide. Okay, that's a typo. So it's probably said my nephew said it was probably taller than the outhouse and damn near twice as wide. He then yelled, you better get out of here or we'll shoot your ass. Luke told his friend to stay trained on it, and he ran back to the bunk and got his gun and three number four shot, three and a half inch turkey load shells. He ran back to the door and stood over top of his friend and aimed at the being. He yelled again to leave. It then started swaying back and forth, and it let out a huff. Luke said on count of three, shoot. They both shot one shell each, and the thing screamed and jumped at least 20 feet to the east where it took four long strides and jumped off a 40-foot high wall. They couldn't make out any features of the damn thing other than the long hair blowing on its arms and legs. They checked next morning, but it rained before daylight. No hair or blood. Fast forward to last year. Due to your encouragement and my own conviction, I took my 15-year-old son spring turkey hunting at the cabin along this, with my nephew. The first morning before daylight, I was apprehensive, walking to the ridge, but I got to my spot with no issues. About 30 minutes before daylight, something on two legs got up about 30 yards from us and took four giant steps away. I was effing done. We went back to the cabin. I wanted to leave with one more day remaining. My nephew talked me out of it. He wanted to hunt one morning. My son, against my judgment, begged to go with Luke the next morning. Luke assured me they would go just a little ways past the pasture. After only 30 minutes of daylight, I seen them coming back down the trail. They said three trees had been pushed over around them. Steve, there is no wind. I'm a little ashamed to say it. I've just sold off some of my hunting gear. My joy of hunting is gone. Steve, you're rapidly raising awareness about these effing things. You're doing a great public service. Keep your eyes open, brother. Mike, if any questions, my number is. Wow, that sucks, Mike. That really, really sucks. Um, I don't know, man, you know, from what I've, from what I've understand, from what I've heard from past people, you go teeing off in the suckers with a firearm without them threatening you. It's, I don't think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. And, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if that bird shot would have killed that thing or not. Those things are pretty thick apparently, right? And it could take a beating. But uh, I think I would definitely be concerned for your son after teeing off one of those suckers intentionally firsthand and then going back in that timber again after that. I don't know if there would be any retribution coming his way or not. I guess if they push those three trees down around them and they didn't kill him, that's a sign that it's probably safe. Whatever's going on around that property is going on, and they're there, and they're going away. I don't think, you know what, I don't know what I can do. I can't really be a Tobin, to, Tony Robbins type motivational speaker through here to you and uh, and try to give you confidence to go back in the woods and not drop your hunting passion. Because obviously that's what I'm going to do, right? And uh, it's like when I do at home where I've run into these things or felt that pressure or felt felt like it's just not right here or seen the footprints or whatever, um, I just go somewhere else. I've got a handful of places I have not gone back to because they I had the shit scared out of me a few times, and I just don't go back there. I just avoid those places, but I haven't get up, given up my hunting, and I still go out alone. I still go out alone in northern British Columbia. I still go alone in the Rocky Mountains. I go alone in the coastal mountains here in southwestern BC, probably more than anywhere else. And this is as well where there is the most activity of sightings of these things too, right? So do I get nervous at times? Yeah, sometimes, you know, just up the river here, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, I was real nervous one morning. I don't know why, I was nervous as hell. Kept hearing noises, then I heard a boom in the timber, and then uh, 
it just didn't feel good that day. I stuck it out, but I'm in the wide open riverbed. And I got a camera too. They don't like that shit. And then I went home. And then I've been hunt, fishing up here twice since then. Same spot. Not a problem. Didn't feel a twinge. So, but some of the places that I go, I'm 100% confident these things, these beings, these wild people, whatever they are, they aren't there full time where I am. They're there sometimes. And when I feel an inkling of pressure, I, I can just feel a pressure, you know, before I enter that huge patch of timber, go up that mountain, I just feel what I call pressure. And then it's kind of a, er, I'm not feeling too cool about this. If, you, if I even feel the slightest feeling like that, I just turn around and leave and I go somewhere else. But I don't give it up altogether, right? So it might be, might be something for you to think about before you drop it all together. But everybody's going to react differently to these experiences, right? They're not good. These aren't these experiences aren't good on average, and the outcome isn't good on average. But thanks for sharing that email, man. I hope I hope some of my words may have possibly helped. But dear Steve, I read to you to relay the account of what I experienced while fishing alone one day when I was 15 years old, the third week of June 2001. This was the first of many of a variety of strange things I would encounter, but by far I believe the strangest. It happened on New River Gorge, National River federal land upstream of Prince and the mouth of Glade Creek. My father and I arrived, set up camp, and I believe he went back to the small community to get ice for the cooler. I proceeded alone upstream fish for smallmouth. It was late morning. Eventually coming to the standing pillars of a bygone era railroad bridge. All right, I, I read this one. This sounds familiar, I don't know, but I'm going to I'm gonna read it anyways because they said it was their third time sending it in. We'll see. Dear Steve, this email will be my third sending in. I understand you're a busy guy. Emails may get read, but not recorded or even lost amongst the other emails. This one is in regards to what happened to my husband last night. We live in Midwest, Wisconsin. It was strange. I only heard a muffled sound. I was in the house with our son. He had taken the dog out for his nightly walk. He said that as he started on their walk, they heard all the sounds of the woods. Squirrels, birds, coyotes, howling, and a neighbor's dog barking down the hill about a quarter mile. We live out in the country, so we hear all these sounds frequently. Our dog was on high alert as his haunches were up the whole time. As they got about a halfway down our driveway, they heard a rabbit scream and all went eerily silent. He said the dog tucked his tail between his legs and started back for home. Here he comes again. Background noise 101. Sometimes these background noises don't bother all you guys, but they bug the shit out of me. So I'll wait for this freaking helicopter to go by again. funny those guys know there's a handful of fishermen up and down this river i don't know why they fly 100 yards up off the riverbed dickheads anyway he said the dog tucked his tail between his legs and started back for home even the neighbor's dog quit barking after the sound we hear rabbit screams often and so does the dog so it's nothing new my husband said he felt as if they were being watched on the way back to the house as they came in the door the dog headed straight for his kennel still tail still tucked between his legs. A four-year-old asked what's wrong with the dog. My husband then explained to me what happened. Obviously our son doesn't understand yet. All I could do is think it's still hanging around. I want to put this out there for anyone and everyone. They know we know they exist and stick around our property. We never let our son out of our sight when we were outside playing and the dog was always with us too. I've had many occurrences of these beings throughout my life. I've never had a face-to-face -face and pray to God I never do. There are at least two up by our property. I know this because the last email I sent would have explained. Thank you again for all you're doing, and all of us need to get these things off our chest. To also talk about these things on a regular basis, kind regards, CS. All right, thanks for that, and I apologize if I haven't read your other, your other emails yet. Um, it's definitely not by choice, I'll tell you what. There's many, many, many people who uh, who are waiting to, to hear their message being shared with the rest of the people. And that's why people are doing this. And we'll get to them. 
Keep an eye on your boy in the backyard. That's it for sure. Don't ever let him play with other dog. Steve, my name is Dennis. You asked for some to explain why we believe the Sasquatch use infrasound. I'm not sure I would call all of what they use as infrasound. As I've experienced some of these things and started using that term to explain it to others. Probably because people are familiar now with the term. I think a lot of what you say, I think a lot of what they use is a type of thought energy. This is where the feelings of dread, feelings of extreme fear come from. I do believe they are also capable of some type of directed energy release they can use for hunting and they can mix the thought energy with. When people describe hearing the loud roars or screams and say they can feel it in their chest or their whole body and are unable to move, that sounds more like infrasound. From about the age of six, I felt a somewhat enhanced sense of intuition. I could tell things about people and occasionally see things that other people could not. The sixth sense you've talked about. Have even had an experience similar to yours of feeling that a person was completely evil and dangerous the first time I encountered them. At 14 in 1978, I started realizing that I could see things in the spirit realm on occasion. About that time, I met and started training with a Native American, Apache friend in martial arts. I even got into some of shamanic arts. I found that I was actually very good at mental shape-shifting, becoming an animal in your mind without actually transforming physically. Also, at the age of 14 is when I saw a Sasquatch for the first time. I may tell the entire story of that later. I will say that I was so traumatized by the experience that I blocked it out of my mind for 30 years. Flying back up the valley. Maybe a hundred yards off the riverbed again. And now they're spinning around right beside me. Who knows what the hell they're doing? They're obviously not counting fish. Are they counting elk, maybe? I haven't a clue. Are they spying on fishermen and counting fishermen? I haven't a clue. They tracked them like frickin' flies to shit, I'll tell you what. All right, where was I? Also at the age of 14 is when I saw a Sasquatch for the first time. I may tell the entire story of that later. I will say that I was so traumatized by the experience that I blocked it out of my mind for 30 years, or so I thought. Looking back now, I wonder if it somehow erased the memory of that experience. I don't know. At the age of 19 in 1983, while training again in martial arts, Nenpo, I started learning about thought transfer, transferring your thoughts to another, but making them think they had the thought themselves and thought reception, receiving someone else's thoughts, like the Jedi thing. I impressed my instructor by being able to do this right away, as soon as he explained it. Kind of found out then also that I had a gift for remote viewing. The Sasquatch people are very good at these things, but I did not know this till years later. On a few occasions in my early 20s, I had encounters with what I think were spirit beings and not Sasquatch. I actually felt the presence of and seen what I would describe as demonic and angelic beings. My first encounter of what I described as infrasound, but it now, but but know it now to be more like the thought transfer thing that I learned. It happened in 2000, California. I was solo rock climbing and felt something watching me the whole time I was on the cliff. I thought it was people at the campground who I could see the rock, who could see the rock face. As I finished climbing, it was about an hour before it dark. I packed up all my gear and once again felt something watching me. This time it felt menacing. Then suddenly I'm feeling extreme fear and the feeling I was in danger. Then the thought to run. I took off running but realized I was running in the wrong direction, away from camp and further into the woods. I also started telling myself that there was no reason for this type of panic. And as soon as I got to the edge of the forest you could see the campground, this all went away. At this time the memories of my encounter with the Sasquatch at age 14 had not returned. It was in 2008, 30 years after my first encounter, living in Colorado, I came across some 18 tracks in the snow one evening. I forgot the inches, I might have said 18 inch tracks in the snow one evening. I came here in 2000, had been traveling all over the mountains, but had never seen anything like these tracks before.
flying up the riverbed again, maybe 100 yards up. Directly over the water. Annoying as F. All right, let's try that again. Living in Colorado, I came across some 18 inch tracks in the snow one evening. I came here in 2000, had been traveling all over the mountains, but had never seen anything like these tracks before. When this happened, all my memories from my first encounter came flooding back. Since then, I got into trying to find out as much as I can about them. I also looked back at the incident in California in 2000, just before I came to Colorado, and realized that it was most likely a Sasquatch and that the fear I felt was some kind of thought transfer they used. I heard someone use that term infrasound and started using it myself. Now, from later experiences, I realized that infrasound does not really explain all this. There's an energy of some kind that they can transmit along with the, trans with the thought transfer. I've felt this energy on a number of occasions. I actually started using the thought transfer, telepathy, mind speak, with them first, never expecting any type of response. I found when they use this energy that all the insects and every living thing in the forest can hear it and go completely quiet. To explain how I know this, I was in the U.S. Army from 84 to 94. In 1987, I got into a fight with another soldier, and he bit the top of my right ear off. While the nerves were exposed to my ear, I had what seemed like super hearing in that ear. My left ear compensated for that, and I started getting almost super hearing in it. Once the right ear healed, I lost hearing there, but it remained in the left ear. I hear like a buzzing sound anywhere I go can hear all the insects, can hear people talking from a long distance away, and can hear machinery and electronics that other people can't. I notice that all these sounds I can hear go quiet, at least all the living sounds, when these beings use this energy transfer. Our government, as I am sure you're aware, also has this technology. For reasons I'm not completely sure of, I've been under constant surveillance from some stupid agency of the government since right after 9-11-2001. Over this period since, I have witnessed a lot of their surveillance tech change over the years. They use microwave signals designed for surveillance through walls or a brush to watch and listen. I used to be able to hear those signals very well. Now they have changed the frequencies a bit so I can no longer hear them as well, but I still know when they're using them. When they use these microwave signals, the same thing happens with all the living creatures around me. They all go quiet. Now they use these signals to charge their non nanotech cameras and listening devices. The devices are so small they cannot hold a very big battery and need to be charged every few days. They need an electromagnetic field around them to charge them. Anyway, if they were not so stupid, they realized that they have been wasting all the resources all these years guessing hundreds if millions of dollars so far just watching me. One case I think they may be following is a murder case from the 90s that I had a psychic experience about. I called into local police about what I saw about the case. Guess that made me a suspect. I'm pretty sure I may have solved that case in 2004 and only cost me 75 cents for the info. But they don't want to talk to me. So they, have, so they can figure it out for themselves. Enough of that. More recent experiences with the Sasquatch and the energy they know how to manipulate have had encounters with nine of them since September of last year, all different individuals. I have felt this energy from two of them. One was the leader of a family group who occupied a large area wilderness area to the north of me. As I was camping and had already encountered three of these beings that night, I woke from a dream and felt this energy around me. Not threatening though. Then we heard the word welcome in my head. On two other occasions it was not so friendly. On both of these times, I could feel this menacing energy moving toward me and hear everything but the creek go silent. On the first incident, I hear what sounds like a snake in my head getting louder as it got closer, but I knew it was a Sasquatch doing this. I kind of blocked it and shook it off, letting the being know that I was aware of what he was doing. Pretty sure I pissed it off more. This happened again about a week later, but this time it made the sound of a wolf howling, but again I knew it was the same Sasquatch. This one is very intelligent, but mean and dangerous. Two nights in a row after I heard the welcome from the group leader, I had two Sasquatch literally sat outside my tent like they were babysitting me. I reached out to them with my mind and asked why. The response I got back from the one who welcomed me was, 
Members of the other group want to take you. Guessing that is one who attacked me those two times with that energy telepathy thing. You had someone email you and said something about hearing something they thought was a territorial dispute, and you said they are not animals and don't have territories like animals. Actually, what I found out is they do have regional, tribal, and family group slash band territories, much like the First Nations people. I believe that one that attacked me is an outcast from the tribe, and he has a distinctive boundary that he cannot cross, which I believe to be a creek there. That is why he attacked me with the, for lack of a better word, infrasound slash thought energy, and not physically. I don't cross that creek. The only thing is, there is a very popular hiking trail that follows that creek and crosses it several times. And I am worried that this being may harm others on that trail. It may have already happened. While doing a search and rescue in that area, I found an abandoned hunter's camp with everything there in the tent except for the hunter, his weapon and pack. At that time in 2012, it had been there for several months from the previous fall hunting season. There's another being that lives in that area, some type of malevolent spirit being that resembles a wrath. I tried, it tried to attack me as well. I think it and the rogue outcast Sasquatch are working together. Last thing, we also asked in one of your videos if anyone was actually communicating with these beings to ask them what is hunting them, what they are afraid of. The general answer I got was that they had been hunted by us since the beginning and there are still humans hunting them. That is why they hide. Sorry about the long email, there's actually much more if we were to describe all the different encounters I've had. Thank you for, thank you for all you've been doing to help those who've had experiences. Dennis Severns. Well, that's definitely a chunk to take in, eh, Dennis? That was a big share, man. That was a lot of information shared. And uh, a lot for the average brain to wrap around, take in and try to process, right? But, you know, um, one thing for certain is, what, thousands of times, possibly around North America and the rest of the planet, people have experienced these words and these feelings entering their head, right? And you're probably one of, one of the uh, few who have actually addressed this with confidence via an email through to all of us, right? So it really is something else, I'll tell you what, and I will possibly be taking a few missing pieces of my puzzle and adding them in after hearing your email and hopefully somebody else out there as well um, can make sense of what you just shared and it'll assist them in some way too right that's quite the chunk to take in and process and uh, interesting to say the least right it's amazing this lifetime is freaking amazing.